Hello and welcome to Crash Course. Today we're going to be taking a look at the urogenital system. So this video series comprises of four videos and in the first video today we're going to be looking at the basic principles of the urogenital system including anatomy of the urogenital system and embryology and then in future videos we're going to take a look at some other functions of the urogenital system such as renal functions, the bladder and female and male anatomy and hormones. But for today let's focus on the anatomy and embryology. So to start with, let's have a look at what you already know. So where is spermatozoa produced? So think of the order of the structures that the sperm travels along in its journey before ejaculation, and hopefully this will allow you to understand that the spermatozoa is produced in the seminiferous tubules, and there are between 400 and 600 of these in the testes, and they're highly coiled, and then it travels to the straight tubules, and then to the right testes, and eventually it travels through the ductus deferens, or vas deferens, before ejaculation. So question two, erythroperitin is vital in the production of what? Is it white blood cells, red blood cells, proteins, or electrolytes? So remember that the kidney has got endocrine functions, and one of these is to produce erythroperitin, which is vital in the production of red blood cells. And final practice question, the uterus in females can be described as what? Is it antiverted and anti-rotated, angled upwards and backwards, antiverted and anti-flexed, retroverted and retroflexed? So the answer here is antiverted and anti-flexed. And it can be seen laterally if you look at this picture here as it sits on top of the bladder. So in terms of basic principles of the urogenital system, the urogenital system deals with the organs and structures concerned with reproduction and excretion of urine. And although reproduction and excretion are unrelated, the structures involved in excretion and reproduction are morphologically associated and often use a common duct. And this come back, comes back to embryology, which we'll look at in a moment. So the major structures of our urinary system include kidneys, ureters, bladder and urethra. And the major structures of our reproductive system, of course, differ in males and females. And in males, it's the testes, the sperm ducts, the urethra, the seminal vesicles, and the prostate gland and penis. And in the female, it's the ovaries, the fimbrae, the fallopian tubes, tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. So let's look at some anatomy of the urinary system now. And I always think that during this part, it's a good idea to pause the video at different points to allow you to try and answer um, the anatomy. Because we're going to go through it fairly quickly here. So here we have the right kidney, and of course this is the left kidney. Remember, it's back to front in terms of what our right and left sided are. Sitting on top, we have the adrenal or suprarenal glands. The artery running from the kidney, the main artery, is the right and left renal artery, which runs back to the aorta. Coming down from the kidney on each side, you've got the ureters, and this leads to the bladder, and they enter superolaterally here. Coming out of the bladder, you've got the urethra. Going back up, we said before, this is the abdominal aorta. So if we zoom out and take a look at the kidneys in situ, we can label the exact same things again. But this time, let's label some of the different elements. So this is the inferior vena cava, travelling blood back up to the heart. This, of course, is the abdominal aorta, as we've already said. This is the esophagus, piercing through the diaphragm to the stomach. The stomach's been taken out of this um, section. This is the bifurcation of the aorta, and this occurs at L4, lumbar uh, level 4, and it bifurcates into the left and right iliac arteries. This is the inguinal ligament, and it's diagonally on both sides of the body. This is the right renal vein, and common sense says this must be the left renal vein. And down here, this again is the bladder, and you can just see the superior element of it here. So let's take a look at a kidney. So this is where we've taken a kidney and chopped it in half. So the kidney can be split into a cortex and a medulla. So in between the pyramids, we have the renal columns. And there are 12 renal pyramids normally that make up the medulla. This goes into a minor calyx, follows into a major calyx, and then into the renal pelvis in the middle before going towards the ureters. And the hilum is the point where kind of all these vessels uh, merge together. So the ureter comes out of the kidney, the renal vein and the renal artery can be seen all at the hilum. So the bladder, so the first thing to label, these are the ureters coming in superlaterally into the bladder. And this is the trigone of the bladder, uh, the muscular part 
really here. This is the detrusor muscle, so this is under our contraction in order to cause excretion of urine. This is the internal urethral sphincter, and this is the external urethral sphincter. So we have control over just the external urethral sphincter, and the internal urethral sphincter is uh, involuntary. This is the pelvic floor, which contributes to our continence levels, and this can sometimes be damaged in pregnancy, causing incontinence. This is the urethra coming out of the bladder, and that's the neck of the bladder. Looking at the pelvis in a little bit more detail, this is the iliac crest. This is the ASIS, or anterior superior iliac spine. This is the pubic tubercle, the pubic symphysis, the pubic crest, the pectineal line, the, and the kidney, uh, sorry, the pelvis can be split into three fundamental parts, the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. At the top there we have the sacrum, and this is the posterior superior iliac spine, the sacral iliac joint, the acetabellum, and this is the obturator foramen, so obturator um, means whole really, so obturator foramen. As I said before, at this point it's really useful to kind of pause the videos and try and label as much as you can yourself and then just go through these as answers afterwards. So this is a scrotum and inside the scrotum we have the testes. This is the glans penis and therefore this is the foreskin of a prepuce as it's anatomically called. This is the urethra running through the penis and then this is the corpora cavernosum and the corpora spongiosum which are the muscular layers surrounding the penis. On top of the testy there we have the epididymis, and then coming from there we have the vas deferens, which runs up um, and down here through, and it passes through several structures through the prostate, the seminal vesicle and so on, and down out um, on a common pathway with the urethra. We have a rectum there at the back, this is a prostate gland, and if this prostate gland can swell up it can cause compression of the urethra and therefore cause difficulty in urination. Pubic symphysis there and the seminal vesicle as well. And at the top there we have the bladder, as you can see the urethra running from that. Zooming in on one of the testes, this is the ductus deferens, or vas deferens, it can also be called. This is the epididymis, the head of it, and these are the rate testes. Down here we have the tail of the epididymis, and then inside we have the seminiferous tubules, where we've already covered, there's 400 or so of these, and these are where the spermatozoa is produced. This is the tunica albuginae, and this is the tunica vaginalis, which surround the testi. These are efferent ductules, and these are our straight tubules. So you can trace the pathway from the seminiferous tubules to the straight tubules, uh, down to the rate testes, through the efferent ductules, and to the head of the epididymis. It then travels up through the ductus deferens, um, and comes on a common pathway with the urethra for ejaculation. This is a very simplified view of the female genitalia, but it's good for understanding uh, where things lay in the in the pelvis. This is the uterus, and below that we have the pubic symphysis, and above it we have the bladder and the fimbrae, which collect the egg as it's released from the ovary, and it travels down the fallopian tube from the fimbrae, then goes to the uterus. At the back there we have the rectum and the buttocks, and this here is the anus, and therefore this is the cervix. So the cervix is the opening of the uterus, which leads to the vagina at the front here. And then we have the bladder. So how we were talking about before, the uterus sits on top of the bladder, up there, antivertus and antiflex. And then the bladder's underneath, leading to the urethra. And at the front, you've got the labia majoris and labia minoris, which can be seen anatomically externally. So then we have the uterus and the vagina um, zoomed in on it again. So this is a fimbrae here, leading from the ovary into one of the fallopian tubes. The egg will then travel down the fallopian tube into the uterus and implant into the, uh, the walls of the uterus. This is the ovarian ligament, which is kind of holding everything in place here. So at the top of the uterus, we call this a fundus, and then the uterus main body is here. There are three layers, muscular layers, of the uterus, so the perimetrium, the myometrium, and the endometrium, and the egg implants on the endometrium, first of all, the most inner layer. But again, we've discussed this is the cervix, which leads to that long muscular tube, which is the vagina below, and there are lateral fornices either side, which can be palpated on a bimanual examination as well. Now moving on to embryology, we are going to go through this fairly quickly, but we look at the embryology of the kidney and then we'll look at the embryology of the reproductive system as well. So in terms of an overview for the kidneys, there are three stages which are really important. It's pronephros, mesonephros and metanephros, and these can be seen in a diagrammatic view here if you prefer to learn in that way. 
So first of all, we have pronephrosm. This is the first stage of a kidney. It develops during the fourth week of uterine life in the cervical region of the intermediate mesoderm. And the pronephros contains lots of segmental vesicles and has a pronephrotic duct that uh, grows cordially towards the cloaca. What I would say in terms of kidney development is really that it's important to be aware of the three stages and be aware of roughly what goes on in these stages, how they kind of digress and the next stage takes over, and how it can go wrong in order to lead to clinical conditions. Stage two is mesonephros, and here this occurs during um, around week towards the end of week four up until around week 10, and it's a functioning kidney during the first trimester because it produces urine during weeks six to 10. So most of the tubules eventually degenerate, but leave behind these mesonephric ducts or wolfian ducts, which extend towards the cloaca. And finally, we have metanephros, and this is where the kidney begins to develop later on in the embryonic period towards the fifth week, and the mesonephric ducts from the mesonephros kidneys develop an outgrowth called the ureteric duct, and this duct is close to the attachment of cloaca, the ureteric duct eventually forms the ureter, renal pelvis, major calyces, minor calyces, and collecting tubule. So the main development of the kidneys occurs in this third phase, a little bit later on in the kidney development. But it all happens really within the first 10 weeks or so. And this is an example of what it looks like uh, in terms of diagrammatic view. So you have pronephros first of all, then mesonephros, and then finally metanephros. The metanephros kidney is our final functioning kidney that remains. And the kidneys, remember, ascend down from the, pe uh, the pelvis, up to their normal position um, in, the, in the posterior aspect of the abdomen. So next we can think about male and female differentiation, and this occurs around weeks 6 to 8 of gestation. This diagram here on the right hand side beautifully summarises the differences in terms of how we can end up with either ovaries or testes, and it really is down to the malarian ducts and the wolfian ducts. So either the malarian ducts will degrade, the wolfian ducts will um, continue to become our epiderm, epididymis and vas deferens, and therefore this will be a masculinization process, or the wolfian duct will degrade instead of a malarian duct, and therefore malarian ducts will become uterine tubes in the uterus, and therefore form the ovaries. And this is really the overview and the basis of male and female differentiation, which occurs early on in this embryonic life. So the embryology of your testes between the third month and end of pregnancy, the testes become transformed transferred from the lumbar area into the future scrotum. So what's really important about this is that the testes are moving from high up uh, in the lumbar area down into the scrotum, whilst the kidneys are doing the opposite. The kidneys are ascending up into that lumbar area. So the kidneys and testes kind of cross over positions, I guess, during embryological terms. So the transfer is due to a combination of growth processes and hormonal influences, and the gubernaculum is what is really the driving force for the te testes coming down into the scrotum. And this explains it in a little bit more of a diagrammatic view here. You can see the gubernaculum, number one, pulling down on the testes into the scrotum, where they finally end up. And embryological malformations can lead to the testes being left in that lumbar area. And it's really important that they're dealt with quickly uh, and brought down into the scrotum. Otherwise, it can lead to things like cancers um, developing within the testes in the future. And if we think about the females now, so embryology of the ovaries, so this time the mesonephric or wolfian duct degenerates and, and the um, malarian ducts predominates and stays and becomes the uterine tubes in the uterus. And in terms of development of the uterus, away from the ovary, the two paramesonephric ducts fuse in the midline to form the uterus. And the surrounding connective tissue differ differentiates to form the follicular cells, which are very characteristic of a female feminization development. And finally, we have the embryology of the uterus and the vagina. So the entire vagina is formed from a paramesonephric or a malarian duct and does not have a contribution from the urogenital endoderm. The initially paired ducts fuse in the midline, forming the single body of the uterus. And the ducts, the initially paired ones, remain separate laterally when they form the uterine tubes, so the fallopian tubes or the uterine horns. And the duct's peripheral attachment site to the urogenital sinus wall is described as the malarian tubercle. And the fused ducts also generate the vagina under the influence of BMP4, and estrogen will also later alter the vaginal epithelium, so it's always under the influence of hormones in its development. And that's everything for this video. Unfortunately, it has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour of anatomy and embryology, because it's something where you just need to get the diagrams in front of you and just do your best to, to go over and revise. Particularly with embryology, try to um, draw these flowcharts as they really help in understanding what happens when and why it happens. 
And that's everything for this video. Thank you very much for watching. If you do have any questions, please do get in touch. Thank you very much.